Welcome to Comic Tropes, I'm your host Chris. Back in 2007, Marvel Comics did something with Spider-Man that did not go over very well with readers at the time. They ended the marriage of Peter Parker and Mary Jane, and they did it in a pretty weird way. They had Peter trade his marriage and people's memories of it to a demon in exchange for the continued life of his elderly aunt. It was weird, but what's done was done, it was time to move forward. From that point, Marvel hired four writers to take over Spider-Man's ongoing stories. One of them was Dan Slott, and in 2010, he became the sole writer of Spider-Man's stories. He wanted to do something big, and he did. He decided to kill Peter Parker. Now, that was met with a wide range of responses from readers at the time, but I'm going to argue that the superior Spider-Man story arc is one of Spider-Man's best. I think it truly gets to the core of what it means to be a hero and specifically what makes Spider-Man unique. So without any further ado, let's talk about it. Dan Slott was born in Berkeley, California in 1967 and got a job as an unpaid intern at Marvel Comics while in college. After graduating, he worked his way up to assistant editor and was able to get some of his first writing assignments in comics on books like Ren and Stimpy and Marvel Comics Presents by 1991. His first published work was at Marvel on books like Mighty Mouse Issue 10 and a backup story in New Warriors Annual 1, both from July of 1991. But I would argue that he made his biggest splash in 2003, writing the Batman limited series Arkham Asylum Living Hell for DC Comics. His knowledge of comic lore combined with his loyalty to the spirit of characters and his sense of humor combined to make a great book with some cool new characters. That in turn led Marvel to sign Slot to an exclusive contract. Dan's sense of humor made him a great fit on books like She-Hulk and Human Torch and The Great Lakes Avengers, where he brought back a then-obscure character, Squirrel Girl. On his superior Spider-Man run, we get gags like this robot wondering why he was programmed to feel pain. Slot is very loyal to history and continuity. An example of this is this post of his on Twitter, where he talks about how one of the first things he did as an assistant editor was to make sure that artists drew Captain America's uniform correctly, with a red stripe directly under the star on his chest. In 2008, his hard work paid off, and he got the nod from Marvel to work on their premier title, with issue 546 of Amazing Spider-Man, the first issue to follow the controversial Brand New Day storyline. Slot would go on to write Spider-Man for almost a decade, and he's come back to the character since. In 2010, sales were okay on Spider-Man, but could stand to be goosed. So, Dan Slot had Spider-Man's arch enemy kill him in issue 700 of Amazing Spider-Man, and the sales did indeed get a huge boost, from a little over 70,000 copies sold on issue 699 to a whopping 200,000 on issue 700, easily cementing itself as the best-selling comic that month. Leading up to issue 700, Dr. Octopus was dying. Now, I will argue that Dr. Octopus is Spider-Man's best arch enemy. He's a dark reflection of where Peter Parker could have gone but didn't. A scientist with anger instead of empathy. So Dr. Octopus is dying, and he successfully swapped minds with Peter Parker. Now he's in Spider-Man's body. That is the jumping off point for the superior Spider-Man story arc. Peter's trapped in a dying body. Let's recap the plot so that we can move forward. Initially, Dr. Octopus's goal was simply to escape death, and he did so by swapping minds with Spider-Man. This also gives him access to all of Peter Parker's memories. Meanwhile, Peter desperately tries to swap things back, but ultimately appears to fail. That said, there's some sort of echo or ghost of Peter that can witness everything happening to his body with Doc Ock's mind running the show. Peter may have some small measure of influence as he keeps Dr. Octopus from killing, and the villain declares that he will actually prove himself better than his rival by becoming the titular Superior Spider-Man. 
To that end, he upgrades Spider-Man's technology, including filling the city with an army of spider bots that monitor the citizens and keep him alerted to potential crimes. Dr. Octopus is more ruthless, adding claws to the suit and eventually extra arms, mirroring his old octopus arms. Dr. Octopus's ego won't allow him to live his life without his doctorate, so he bails on Peter's relationships and focuses on his job and education. Along the way, Octopus begins to fall for his fellow student, Anna Maria Marconi. While he is more ruthless than Peter ever was as Spider-Man, Dr. Octopus slowly finds that by pretending to be a hero, he is slowly becoming one. He grows to enjoy the positive attention and becomes a bit more empathetic. Along the way, he discovers Peter is still in his head and erases that consciousness. However, he later digs into the memories which brings Peter back. Ultimately, Doc Ock finds himself in a situation where he doesn't believe that he can save Anna Maria's life, and he allows the memory fragments of Peter Parker to retake his own body. The story featured interesting twists and turns. At one point, Otto steals the Venom symbiote and becomes the superior Venom. His education is briefly set back when he is accused of plagiarizing Otto Octavius's research work. Otto establishes Parker Industries, a successful tech company. There's a cat and mouse game where police officer Carly Cooper suspects from the beginning that Spider-Man isn't acting normal and continues to dig into what had happened to him. And during the Superior Spider-Man run, Slot also wrote the Spider-Verse event, which meant that both Peter Parker and a slightly in the past Otto Octavius simultaneously operate as Spider-Man together, among dozens of other alternate Spider-Men. Spider-Mans? Spiders-Man? You know what I mean. The Superior Spider-Man story features true character growth, where Otto Octavius is forced to reconcile with his arrogance, and how he uses it to hide that he is not truly superior, and that he knows it. Doc Ock gives Peter Parker back his body to save the life of a woman he grew to love. The final moments of Otto in the Mindscape giving Peter back his life gave me legit goosebumps when I read it. It was years worth of character growth. You must have no distractions, no confusion. I'm expunging all my memories, one after the other. My life as a villain must be erased, along with my heroic deeds. And finally, what I've held on to so passionately, but it must go as well. My Anna Maria. You, you really love her. Yes, and to save her, I must give up every part of that love, for I know only you can save her, because you are the superior Spider-Man. Let's discuss the fan and critical response to killing off Peter Parker, because to say that the outcries were strong is an understatement. And yet, Marvel Comics, Dan Slott, the artists, and the editors on Spider-Man stuck to their guns, and they slowly won people over. The initial response to the Superior Spider-Man story was primarily one of outrage. CNN even reported on the vitriol coming from the readers. The letters pages of Superior Spider-Man's early run featured the reactions of readers who had just read Peter's death in Amazing Spider-Man number 700. To say they weren't happy about it is, again, an understatement. Here's an example. Doc Ock wins. Crime pays. I just want to puke. You seriously want me to believe, embrace, and get excited over the fact that the villain who murdered the hero will make a better hero than the hero ever did? Can you not appreciate how wrong that is? I didn't think you could do anything more depraved in the life of Peter Parker than have Norman Osborn fathering children with Gwen Stacy before he murdered her, but hats off to you. You topped it. You've tainted your entire mythos. The only thing that's superior is your ability to deceive yourselves into thinking how shocking or clever or controversial you are when all you have done is violate the most fundamental rules of storytelling and undermine everything comics has ever stood for. 
Who wants to read stories about your favorite hero whose body is now inhabited by Otto Octavius? I could handle one issue, but it seems you have something much longer in mind. I've been a regular reader since 1971, but I think I'll take a break. When I hear rumors of Peter's return, I'll start buying again. I was left feeling disappointed. Some critics gave it some pretty rough reviews early on. A quick look at issue one's reviews on Comic Book Roundup shows us a nice summary of that. And then, if we jump to the final issue, we see that it definitely won over critics and readers by the end. But it probably made good business sense to end the story arc when they did by issue 33, as sales had gone down to the 70,000 copies a month that Spidey books were at before Superior Spider-Man started. I think that this is an example of a mainstream publisher allowing a creative team to really swing for the fences and stick behind them. I mean, the idea of having Peter Parker supposedly dead when Amazing Spider-Man 1 and 2 were in the movie theaters? That's a pretty ballsy move, in my opinion. Now, these days, Marvel, DC, they do tend to kill their characters a lot, only to bring them back right before their next big movie. This is a little different. So let's go ahead and talk about what, in my opinion, Dan Slott did so well on this run. I will argue that there are several aspects of Spider-Man that continue to resonate with readers. The adventure and power fantasy aspects inherent to most superhero stories, of course, but also the soap opera drama surrounding Peter Parker's life, as he has a large supporting cast of characters around him. He deals with relatable topics like family health, stress from work and bills, and a tumultuous dating life. And perhaps more than any other character, Spider-Man deals with the theme of responsibility. With great power, there must also come great responsibility. So, does the superior Spider-Man tackle these same issues? I'd say yes, from a new point of view. Keep in mind, Spider-Man comics had been coming out for 50 years when Superior Spider-Man started. That's a lot of Spider-Man stories. Sometimes it's good to find a new perspective. Not to say that it always works, but when characters have been coming out this long, sometimes you get things like Superman with new electricity powers. If you've been reading serialized superhero comics long enough, you know that eventually things go back to the factory default. I have long argued that with ongoing serialized superhero books from Marvel and DC, you're always going to get a reset to the status quo, typically when it's time for a new creative team. So, if you can allow yourself to not get hung up on ideas like canon and continuity, it's usually pretty easy to enjoy a fresh creative team. Now, sometimes those ideas don't always land, like Punisher becoming an angel. And other times you get ideas that really do work, like Venom becoming a soldier. And I think Superior Spider-Man does tackle the same topics that Amazing Spider-Man tackled. It explores less of Peter Parker's ongoing day-to-day -day actions, but it does cover what Spider-Man means. When Superior Spider-Man is ruthless, it surprises his longtime friends and fellow superheroes. It showcases what makes Spider-Man different from a character like, say, Wolverine. Doc Ock is living his life in Peter Parker's body, which gives us a new look at relationships with characters like Mary Jane and J. Jonah Jameson. We see that it's Peter's personality that drives these relationships, because Dr. Octopus ruins his dates with Mary Jane while earning the respect of Jameson. There is still romance as Otto connects with Anna Maria. She initially thinks Peter is just a pretty boy, but ends up impressed with Otto's brilliant mind. That new connection drives Otto's transformation into a more selfless character, one who feels a responsibility for something other than himself. We, the reader, are treated to glimpses of Otto's tough life growing up, where he was abused by his father. That means that even though the story starts with Superior Spider-Man as a villain, he still has lines that he won't cross. For instance, he's horrified that fellow supervillain Vulture is using brainwashed children as his minions. The new mind driving Spider-Man's body means that fights with existing enemies like Vulture and Venom are now reimagined with an updated, more cruel fighting style. 
Dr. Octopus upgrades Spider-Man's technology, but we still get to see him swinging through the city and having acrobatic fights. I'd argue that this book really helped cement Ryan Stegman as an up-and-coming superstar artist. And all of this could have been a very dark story, but Dan Slott never forgets to bring the humor. A lot of the time, that's at Otto Octavius' expense, as his expectations fail to meet reality. He assumes that life in a new, younger, powerful body will give him easy wins in dating and career. But instead, he turns off Mary Jane with his arrogance and gets accused of plagiarism for ironically using his own ideas. While you can read the Superior Spider-Man story arc in and of itself and get a complete story, uh, it also successfully set up the next big story arc in Spider-Man's life. Because, of course, when Peter Parker returns to his body, he now has Parker Industries. Uh, all of a sudden, we get to see a Peter Parker without the pressures of paying for bills. Instead, it gave him a whole new set of responsibilities, like uh, his employees' lives or finding out what the effects of his technology on society would be. So, did Superior Spider-Man eventually reset itself at the end? Absolutely! But it still gave us a perspective on Spider-Man, and it gave us some character growth for Dr. Octopus. Character growth that ends in tragedy. Because, of course, having to erase his memories in order to hand back his body to Peter Parker represented a sacrifice. A sacrifice that showed that he'd grown empathy and that he wasn't as selfish as he used to be. It was impressive and sad, and it also showed us that there's always the potential to become a better person. It's never too late to change. Those are my thoughts on the Superior Spider-Man story arc. I'm a fan of what Dan Slott did with Spider-Man. He made changes in his story arcs, and some people didn't like that because we like to see the things that we like to see with Peter Parker, and I get that. But if you know that they are eventually going to come back, sometimes it's nice to have a diversion and look at things in a new light. I like that stuff anyway. I hope that you'll consider checking it out if you haven't already, and if you've read it and you had a different opinion, I'd be curious, first of all, to hear those opinions in the replies below. Hopefully this at least gives you a different perspective on how I look at things. I like Dan Slott's writing. I also really do recommend his book uh, Arkham Asylum Living Hell. I thought that that was great. I also loved his Spider-Man Human Torch book, his She-Hulk run. So I had been exposed to some of his stuff before Spider-Man. At the same time, and this is sort of separate from my overall criticism and look at this, but um, I hadn't been reading Spider-Man for a while. Um, I had gotten sort of burned out on it, and I came in once Superior Spider-Man was coming out in trades. It won me over and brought me back to Spider-Man, so uh, I enjoyed that time. I enjoyed coming back to Spider-Man and, and getting something kind of new and different with it. I hope you appreciated this episode. I hope you'll consider hitting like and subscribe. That really helps the channel. I also have another weekly show on Mondays, 5 p.m. Pacific, every week on the channel Pros and Cons. I do a live stream for about two hours or so, recapping the comic book news of the week, looking at the comic books that came out in the past week. It's a fun show, I chat live with uh, viewers like yourself. I love it. Thank you so much for everything. I'm going to see you real soon, and until that time, keep reading comics. Thanks for watching this video. If you liked it, please consider hitting like and subscribe. If you'd like to support the show, there are merchandise links beneath the YouTube video, and you can always hit join on YouTube or visit Comic Tropes on Patreon to get access to special perks.